after. All right. Uh, about a month, maybe a month and a half ago, Dan approached me and asked me if I had a uh, coming to Jesus story. And uh, he asked me if I would share my testimony. And apparently I said yes, because uh, here I am. Um, yep, I had no idea that would be this many people. But there's a, there's a reason for this. There's a reason why I'm here. It's not an accident that, uh, that I'm here today sharing you my testimony. Um, and it's not an accident that you guys are here either. It's, I, I believe it's God-ordained. There's a reason why you're here. Um, I'm happy to share this opportunity with you. It's been a, a long time coming. Uh, I'm not the only one in the story. You'll see that my wife and I, um, we've gone through some struggles in our marriage. And, uh, but it's all for a reason. Um, my wife, Carrie, and I, um, we have uh, three beautiful kids and two others that are really beautiful. They're not our biologicals, but they're going to be staying with, for, staying with us for a while. They may not look like me. Um, anyway, uh, a caveat, though, I want to share some of the stuff I'm going to be sharing with you today may be of an adult, more adult theme. So if, that's, uh, if you're not ready for your children to hear some of the stuff and you're not ready for the questions, now's the time to maybe have the kids go out. There's another uh, class going on outside. So will you please uh, pray with me right now? Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to share your story. Father, help me to step aside and just speak your truth through me. Father, may all glory and honor and praise be unto you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, so here I am. I'm going to be bearing my soul to you. I may not be stripping down to my underwear, but I am going to be transparent. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you the good, the bad, the ugly, sometimes the very ugly, and not necessarily in, in that order. Um, now there's an inherent risk um, when you share a testimony like this, but because um, I'm going to be sharing with you some of my deepest and darkest sins. Um, on the outside, I look like I have everything put together. You know, I'm pretty good at that. You know, my, my wife dresses me. I've been married now. But, um, but I'm going to reveal my flaws to you. I'm going to be transparent, and I'm going to leave nothing to the imagination. So um, you'll soon realize I'm not perfect, but I have been saved by grace. All right. Let's see here. Some may be shocked. Others may be uh, not surprised at all. But frankly, uh, I'm not concerned about if your opinion changes of me, and that's, and that's fine. What my hope is that God is glorified through me and my life and what he has done in my life. This is where I was. This is where I am. I know where I am in Christ today. That hasn't always been the case in my life. Um, God has been working on me now for 20 years, over 20 years. And uh, it's been a, a hard road. Granted, I'm the one that chose that road, but it's been a hard road. And, uh, but all in all, it's, it's worth the pain and the heartache because now I'm on this side of it. And uh, you'll see what I have to say. And I hope I have your attention now. You know, it's been my experience that when I share my story with others, you know, it, it, it has a way of releasing Satan's power over me. And not only that, the Bible says we should confess our sins to one another. And I, I think that brings power to the Holy Spirit. And then there's other people who identify with me in my past, in my sin, that maybe you're, not, you're so reluctant to talk about it. Now you're not because now you have somebody that you can talk to. If that's you, if the Holy Spirit is prompting you today, don't ignore it. Obey it. Um, so I want to also talk to you about, uh, about being kingdom-minded versus being worldly-minded. This is one of the keys of the sin cycle. Now, I have no idea where you are in your spiritual life, um, but, uh, so this is not directed to any one person. Today could be a turning point for you. And I want you to see what Jesus can do with your sin. So before Christ, I lived my way, I lived my life the way I wanted to live it. It all revolved around me, I, without regard to anybody else but myself. I'm so bright, my dad calls me son. That's, that's how important I am. However you want to say it, I was very selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, self-interested. It's all about me. Egotistic, egocentric, arrogant, and very inconsiderate. I was a bundle of joy to be around. And honestly, there are times I still struggle with this today. 
I'm being self-centered because it's all about me. It's counterintuitive to think of other people outside yourself or to put others first before you. Um, it's a daily, if not minute by minute, decision to do that. Um, anyway, I, I attended church growing up, um, but I didn't like it. I actually hated it. Um, my dad forced me to go, and he never went himself. And that was a bone of contention that I had with my dad. I used that as an excuse not to go to church. And I vowed never to go back to church. So here I am today, you know, by God's grace, that he allowed me to break that vow. It was a stupid vow. Um, sorry. So once I was out of the house, um, on my own, in the Navy, I was 18 years old, out from under my parents' rules and regulation and the shackles of their oppressive ways, I got out of the house while I still knew everything. And now I had Uncle Sam tell me what to do. I was on my own, ready to experience what the world had to offer. And man, did I indulge. Happiness, my happiness was party time. I loved and lived to party. I went to clubs, I went to strip clubs. In fact, I, I dated a stripper for a while. Um, it's not my highlight of my, my life, but I enjoyed getting drunk all the time. I'd be drunk at work, I'd be drunk at home, I'd be drunk all the time. Um, I couldn't wait to have my next drink. I wasn't an alcoholic, but that's just what we did in the Navy. Um, and having sex um, outside of marriage. Um, and then uh, this new uh, invention came about called the computer, and you can look at porn all you want. So I, I uh, indulged in that a lot. You had the hot sex right there in your, the comfort in your own house and nobody had to see you. So um, that was my life when I was in the Navy. Um, while in the Navy, anything and everything is available to you. Um, it's your choice. Obviously, I had nobody force me to do this kind of stuff, but I chose to do that. These are the things that brought me happiness. They made me cool. I was accepted. Um, the world loves their own. They're not going to condemn you. It, it, it's, uh, it's counterintuitive to, to live um, of Christ. In Proverbs 14:12, uh, it reads, uh, "There is a way that seems right to a man, but its, but its end is the way to death." And that's exactly where I was head to death. I lived my life on my terms. I lived it on my way. But, you know, here in America, we can do what we want. We, we have endless freedoms, endless. And that includes the, the freedom to be self-destructive. And I was being self-destructive in those, in those times. Um, if a, a, somebody, well, as a Christian, I'm not, I wasn't a Christian at this point, but as a Christian, you choose to sin, you choose to suffer. But after a couple of years, there was a small part of me began to realize that this type of happiness had an expiration date. It was short-lived, it was temporal. It, uh, you know, I was living my life my own way, but it left me feeling empty. You know, I wasn't uh, fulfilled. I was ashamed, actually. I was guilty. Um, I felt good for nothing. My life was going nowhere fast. I was very unhappy and unfulfilled, but I still tried to fill my life with everything that it had to offer, looking for that happiness. Um, but the more I tried to fill that void, the more empty I became. So then there's, there was no purpose in my life. I got in a lot of trouble with my supervisors. I got in a lot of fights when I was in the Navy. Um, my performance of reports reflected my downturn in my behavior, but I really didn't care. I had a really bad attitude. I started making some really poor choices. And one of the fights I got into got me in a lot of trouble. I tried to throw one of my fellow seamen, I was on a submarine in the Navy, I tried to throw him overboard. Um, yeah, that, that doesn't bode well when you're in the military. You don't try to throw people overboard. So I got restricted to the boat in Canada. And uh, since my Navy time was kind of dwindling, I stopped partying a little bit just enough to save some money because it's my career in the military is not panning out the way I thought it was going to pan out. I was honorably discharged from the Navy in February 95. I was 22 years old, now free from Uncle Sam telling me what to do and where to go and how long. Never again will I join the military. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. I don't know, if you guys don't know me, um, I spent, I'm still in the military. I went back in by the grace of God. He has a, has a sense of humor of bringing things back. So anyway, I'm out of the military. I have about $10,000 in the bank. And I drive back to home, which is in Iowa, Cherokee, Iowa, to my parents' house. And I was so happy to be off that rock called Hawaii. That's what it is. It's just a rock in the middle of the ocean. And all you do is drive around. Yeah, they got some nice beaches, but to be able to drive from L.A. to um, Iowa, it was, it was glorious. I stayed there for a few months and then went to um, Colorado for the next stage of my life, which was college. 
how quickly I forgot those bad times in the Navy. Those down and out moments when adversity and trials and tribulations were so bad, it nearly killed me. Driving home drunk, falling asleep, waking up with whoever next to me. But for some reason, I justified in my mind that eh, it wasn't that bad. I made it. I'm a conqueror. Because I'm on this side of it. I'm not going through it again. So it was party time again, round two. This time, I was all in. Anything goes. Going to clubs again, staying up as late as I want, going to class drunk, not caring about my homework, having sex, pornography, as a, as a, as a dog returns to its vomit. I may have lived it up a little too much. It didn't take me long, about six months, to go through the $10,000 on alcohol and partying. That's a lot of money. You know, it was in the few... The last few weeks in Colorado, I lived out on my, my Chevy Blazer. I took showers where I could, stayed where I could. I had to move out of my apartment because apparently they like money. They need money to, for profit, and I had to drop out of college because they need money too, and I didn't have any. I spent it all. It's gone. I had nothing to show for what I had except for my truck and the stuff that was in the back. So I had to do, absolutely, I had to do what I absolutely did not want to do. I had to swallow my pride and I had to call my parents and ask if uh, I can come, come back because I had nowhere to go. I had nobody to turn to. I was down and out flat on my back. Now when I went back home, I'd like to say that the prodigal son had returned. You know, I squandered all my money, but there was no feast. There was, there was no celebration. But the problem was I hadn't changed. I was still stuck in my old ways. And I brought that to my parents' house. I remember my dad telling me, he's like, you live in my house, under my roof, you live by my rules. <sighs> All right. Which meant I had to go back to the church. And I did. I, I didn't mind it really this much, no, mind it so much this time around, um, because I, I really hated my life. I hated where I was. Um, I hate where I was going. And I remember one Sunday morning, Greg, uh, Pastor Greg Johnson was preaching about something. And there was about 100 people in the congregation, but he was speaking to me. He spoke right at me. The words that he was saying just burned in my chest. Palms oh, started getting sweaty, started getting, you know, <laughs> a little nervous, a little convicted. Like, he's talking right at me. He's, that's, that's me. So, the start of making him a savior of my life, Lord and savior of my life, there was a point in my life when I felt like I needed to grow up. I wanted to grow up, and well, at least I should grow up and put those childish things behind me. I was tired of my life and ready to move past all my old ways. I was baptized in uh, January, 20, January 23rd of 1996 in Cherokee. That was 20 years ago. And I'd like to be able to tell you that my life has been peachy and I've been squeaky clean. I'd be lying to you. Um, the truth is I, I still struggle with fornication, pornography, and lies and everything else under the sun. The, um, these sins were very hard for me to, and difficult for me to give up. But the problem is, that I realized later, um, that I was trying to clean myself up. I was trying to present myself. It took me so long to grasp this truth that I can somehow make myself presentable you know, before the holy and almighty God. It's like, how do you like me now, God? Am I good? I wish somebody would have shared this vital information with me back then, when I first got baptized, that there is nothing that you can do to clean yourself up. Grace does not work that way. You are not good enough. Our attempts to make ourselves holy and clean are feeble. Isaiah, uh, 6, I'm sorry, Isaiah 64, 6 says, All my righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And those filthy rags, those are menstrual rags, dirty rags. Like, that, that's what you want to present to God. All your righteousness, all your righteous deeds, everything you do good, even for God, is filthy rags. You, the only righteousness that com is true righteousness is what comes from, from Christ. The, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by Him. We can only be made holy and, and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's it. How much time I wasted trying to clean myself up. So if that's you, stop trying to clean yourself up. I struggled with these sins for many, many years. 
And eventually I brought them right in my marriage because I thought marriage would fix me. I'd get married and all that stuff would go away. That's further, can be furthest from the truth. I remember the first time I confessed to Carrie. I was so mad. I just vomited all this stuff out on her. She was asking questions, prying. And I just got fed up with all the questions and I just, bleh, here I am. I told her everything. It wasn't a very pleasant conversation, to, uh, to say the least. The information wasn't very well received, and rightly so. We had a rough time working through it. We had our ups and downs. We still have our ups and downs. And if it was, honestly, if it wasn't for our children, um, I think we'd be divorced today. Um, but uh, God has a, a plan. We don't know what that plan is. Our plan was to wait three years to have kids. But Caitlin came out and was, my, Carrie became pregnant three months within our, in our relationship. So in essence, that, you know, that's part of God's plan because he knew that all this stuff was going to come out. Um, the uh, pornography and, um, had uh, um, gone a little bit too far. Or I'm sorry, a lot far. That where uh, you start uh, um, looking at other women. And uh, I've had some infidelity in my life, or other women in my life. Um, and by God's grace, my wife has uh, forgiven me of that. It's one of those hard things. You come to grips with yourself that how far are you willing to go and take this sin in your life all the way? Why do we wrestle with it so much? We sought professional help from a place in Colorado, right next to the Rockies, called uh, the Blessing Ranch. It's awesome. It's basically a one-week intensive marriage counseling session that dealt directly with our situation, our sin. And for me, this is the absolute turning point in my life. This is the, the point where I met Christ as my Lord and made him Lord of my life. This is when I fully submitted to him not only as my Savior, but also as my Lord. Carrie and I, one of the, it was just a week long, so one of the exercises we had to do um, was go out our separate ways, and we had these buckets. And we had to walk along the path and pick up rocks. And these rocks symbolize um, our sin. Um, so the idea is to spend some time with God, pray about this. We have your list of all your sins, and we pick up these rocks, and you know, I found a little overlook so I could just focus on God. I had a big bucket. I could have used two. Um, so I had this list of sins on this paper with all my, my sins. And, and I would pray for God not only to take away my sin, but to also release my grip of them. Did you get that? There's a difference there. I try to illustrate this. You know, If you have your sin here at God and you ask God to take it away, you're going to hang on to it. You're not going to let it go. God's not going to take it away from me either. You need God to take my sin from me and just hand it to him. And he will take it. But he won't take it from you forcefully. He'll allow you to hang on to your sin. So there I was on the bluff. I would confess my sin, and I would throw that rock as far away as I can. Lies. Self-righteousness. You know, self-righteousness. You know what that is? That's, look what I have done. I'm a good person. Why wouldn't God like me? Gossip. Man, I love talking about people. Talk about behind their backs and spread the rumors. Selfishness. The world revolves around me. Throw that rock. Lack of patience. When I, and when I got to the next one, this was a big one. And it surprised me because I didn't expect it. It was, the rock was probably like that big. Anger. I don't know why, but that's, and it, uh, trying to get, throw this rock. Anger was the biggest rock. It was one of my biggest sins. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. And because I, I thought I was ready for the porn one to be the biggest one and the infidelity, the big, biggest rock in that bucket. But to tell you the truth, it was the smallest one in the whole lot of them. And I was able to take that little rock and, and wing it as far away from me as I can. And that day, I remember sitting there, I'm going to share something with you, it might be a little weird, but it, it wasn't just me that experienced this. Um, I felt his spirit stirring with me, 
stirring in me. And every time I threw a rock, the wind would rush over my face. I was sitting there the, on the bluff. It didn't happen just one time. It happened every time, and it wasn't a continuous wind. It was like I threw a rock, confessed my sin, asked God to take it away, and one, like eight or nine times. I was, I can't, words can't describe it. When Carrie and I got together, I told her about what happened to me. She's like, that happened to me too. (laughs) So either we threw the rocks at the same time, or that's just God. That's how God works in mysterious ways. To me, that, I felt as though that was God's way of reinstating me that day. I made him my Lord. He said to my sin, he said to me, he's like, your sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. And I remember it no more. There is weight in that. And I get emotional because I, I have sinned so much. There is so much crap and garbage in my life. I was hanging on to it. And he took it away. And not only that, he reinstated Carrie and I. He said, I have a purpose for you too. You will stay together. And we're in it to win it. We're, this is one marriage. We're sticking it out. So the anger thing. Um, that last thing that was revealed to me, I learned that day overlooking at God's wonderful creation that anger somehow is the root of all my sins. So you look at it, you can tag root, tag uh, anger to lust, Lies, self-righteousness, gossip, selfishness, pornography, everything. It, and it kind of has a way to camouflage itself and, and kind of stay in the shadows. If that's you, you need to deal with that anger. In James 1, 19 through 20, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That anger permeates and all the other sins, and you have a pet sin that you have that you think maybe is the biggest sin, it may not be. That week in Colorado was four years ago this month. Four years. So I worked, God worked on me for 16 years, you know, and I kept on in my sin. And I think the reason why is I, I tried to hang on to it or clean myself up. So what happened was I had a roller coaster of sin in my life even after I was baptized. You know, just because you're baptized doesn't mean that you accept God as your Lord. Maybe as your Savior. That's easy. That's the easy one. It's the Lord one where you actually surrender everything to Him. And you get to the point where I'm I'm done. I'm completely done. It's been a, a long road to recovery, but I believe that God uses our experiences to shape and mold us. Even the ugly ones. He shapes His children. We are His children. I'm a better man today for having to go through those rough times, those tough times. We have a wonderful marriage now because of going through those rough times. I, wish I, I, I don't wish that on anybody. If you can avoid that road, avoid it at all costs. But I'm here to tell you that today, well, just recently, in la- last month, we celebrated 15 years together. 15 years. She stuck by me this whole time. We have five wonderful children, and uh, she has a lot to offer as well. What, what, she knows what it's like to be sinned against. And she knows what it's like to have to forgive <laughs> again and again and again. God uses us. He's using us in our story to help others who are going through similar experiences. My life now is an open book to you. I may not know you personally, but if you have something going on right now, if, if the Spirit is prompting you, don't ignore it. Don't wait. Obey. If he's nudging you, just listen. No matter how painful the process, whatever you have to go through, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I promise you, it is worth it. All right. My life with Jesus. God has taught me a lot of lessons in my life, but... I'm going through this. It started off with three. 
then went to four, now five. I think five main lessons that God has taught me that I want to share with you today, that if you're going through the same thing and there's some scripture that goes along with it, so please bear with me. Um, lesson number one, there will be a struggle. If you're here today and you find yourself struggling with sin, that's a good thing. That's a positive thing to, because at least there's a struggle. You're not just laying over and it's like, ah, well, I'm going to sin anyway. Might as well do it anyway. I'd be more concerned if there wasn't a struggle. And in Hebrews, Hebrews is a great book. If you haven't read it, read it again. Hebrews 12.4, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Think about that. Has anybody in here struggled with their sin to the point of shedding blood? Any hands? Anybody? I haven't. I'm not saying that it's going to come to that because the truth is Christ has already shed his blood. All right. So what we need to do is stop making excuses for ourselves and remember how Christ endured the cross for us and shed his blood for our sins. So there's struggle. There will be struggle. Number two, second lesson is there will be discipline. If you want to be reconciled to God and fully re restored to him, there must be discipline. And I'm here to tell you, it's not pleasant. It sucks. Sucks is not really a, an accurate descriptive word for what you're going to be going through, but it's necessary. There's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that happened in my life that I believe that God disciplined me because of the stuff that I did. You know, I had to tell my wife, and my wife is just, she's so full of grace. But I can only imagine if, that, if the shoe was on the other foot, if she did that to me. In Hebrews 12, 5 through 6, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when he reproved you. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Discipline. I had a great job when I was in Sioux City. I was, I was one of the commanders over there, loved it. And, uh, but I was working a lot. I was working 40, 50, 60 more hours. And my family was taking the brunt of it. They, they were pushed back in the back burner. But I didn't care. I was living, living my, my life and in my job and putting food on the table, putting a roof over our heads. This is where God wanted me to be. I got a call one day that I lost my job. They moved me to another position. To be a commander, to lose your position, that's not a good thing. It was nothing that or I really did. It's just that we had personality differences and the commander didn't like me, the wing commander didn't like me, which is fine. But man, I was depressed. I was in a dark, dark hole. I, I remember uh, I was borderline insubordinate. No, in fact, I was insubordinate to my new supervisor who told me that I had to stay late one day, and I told him no. I said, I'm here at 6, I'm gone at 4.30. If you need me, that's when I'll be here. Um, I would go to work and come home. And uh, God used that, that time, that period of my life to grow me and remind me of who's in control. Through that trial, of being having that new job, I restored our relationship in our marriage. Restored our relationship with our kids. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that trial. I'm standing here and sitting here in front of you today because of what happened back in Sioux City. And going through it, I felt like I was gonna die. I just wanted to sleep. That's all I wanted to do. I wouldn't change it for the world. So there will be discipline. God loves you too much not to discipline you. But I'm telling you, it's, it's worth going through it. Bear with them. At the moment, in Hebrews uh, 12, 11, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Be trained by the discipline. It's good. There are better times. I'm telling you, there's better times on this side of discipline. All right, so enough of that one. There will be struggle. There will be discipline. The third lesson that I learned, you are worth more than you think. This, this one's a difficult one for me, the longest time to believe that I was worth something. I would walk around with this heavy guilt and shame around my neck, even after I was baptized, because, you know, I'd sin and I'd go down 
just trying to get rid of it, trying to clean myself up. And I confessed to Carrie. You know, it's just this endless cycle trying to, and then I got to the point where I, I don't know if I can walk away from this. I had no, self, self, no sense of self-worth. I felt as though I was never good enough. I could never forgive myself and those things that I've done and those, the garbage that I put my wife through. But I'm here to tell you that no matter what you have done, Christ can forgive. All you have to do is accept it. So we have a, a high priest that knows who we are. In Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help, help in time, to find grace to help in time of need. You can't clean yourself up. You're going to have baggage, and he expects that when you go to the cross. You're going to bring it. There it is. Take it. You can't get rid of the baggage. You can't hide it. You can't sweep it under the rug. You have baggage. We all have baggage. We're all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. You need to know and understand this, that through Christ at the cross, when you're at the foot of the cross, you have to look up. We are confronted with grace and mercy, not guilt and shame, which I was before. That's where I, I, I would kind of hang out with the guilt and shame, the worldly view. Satan would always be there to remind me, <laughs> you are not good enough. You'll never be good enough. Look what you did. Look what you did again and again and again. You, Christ doesn't love you. Yes, he does. We had to stop listening to Satan's lies. He wants us to remember our old ways, our old selves, and weigh us down with that. But Christ says, come to me. Be focused on me. All who labor on heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that rest is good. Be motivated by his grace and mercy, not worldly guilt and shame. So you need to be kingdom-minded, not earthly-minded, not worldly-minded. All right, so there'll be a struggle, there'll be discipline. You're worth more than you think. And number four, the fourth lesson I, you cannot save yourself. Excuse me. Truth is, we have, I had to accept that I'm never going to be good enough because I'm not good. Only God is good. Jesus said this. God is good. He is just. He is perfect. And only Christ can forgive sins. All we have to do is accept it as a free gift. I can do nothing to save myself or make myself more presentable. Nothing. Even if I walk the rest of my days not looking at another thing of porn or looking at another woman, but I just keep my life squeaky clean, it's all rubbish. That's self-righteousness. The righteousness comes from God. It's not a badge of honor. Like, look what I've done. Look how good stuff that I've done. That doesn't save you. Christ only saves. In Romans 3, 21 through 26, it talks about this. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. <laughs> Again, there's nothing you can do about it. And this is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood and be received by faith. Not by works, not by brushing yourself off, cleaning yourself up. It's by faith. This is to show that God's righteousness, this was to show God's righteousness because his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. He's got, he doesn't remember your sin anymore. Yeah, he brought all this baggage, but where, where'd it go? As far as the east is from the west. It's a free gift. And it's available to anyone who will accept it. Anyone who places their faith in Christ and believes him to be the Messiah. All right, that was four. Number five, I don't have this up on the slide because I added to it. So you have, there'll be a struggle, discipline. You're worth more than you think. You can't save yourself. And be kingdom-minded. That's, that's the final lesson that I, I wrap this whole thing up is stop focusing on yourself. Stop focusing on the guilt and shame. Stop focusing on what Satan throws in front of you. Look up. You may have to be like knocked out and land on your back. That's a good thing too. Remember the discipline is good. 
when you're on your back, you're looking up. The verse that I want to uh, share with you that correlates with be kingdom minded. I've read over this I don't know how many times, and if you have the same experience as I do, you read the thing over and over again, and you're like, I never read that before. It's in uh, 2 Corinthians, in uh, chapter 5, starting at verse 16. It says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Flesh is earthly thinking. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, they all looked at Christ as a man, but then he was resurrected. Now they don't do that anymore. He, he was God. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. That could be you. All that stuff that you bring, all that baggage and garbage you have in your life, it can go all away through your faith in Christ Jesus. Let it go. Stop dwelling on it. Stop thinking about it. Continuing on. All this is from God through who Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciliating reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and trusting us with the message of reconciliation. If you miss that, not counting their trespasses, that means as though you've never sinned. Who would like to experience that today? As though you've never sinned. Martin Luther called this the great exchange. Christ came into this earth to die for us to assume the sin, your sin, your very sin, all your sin, on himself as though you walk today with no sin. And I'm telling you, that's where I am today. And you could be there too. You just have to be willing to go, th go through the process, wherever that process is, the struggle, the discipline, the self-worth. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore, on implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. There is nothing like it. This life can't offer anything. He offers everything. I am nothing. I was absolutely nothing. I was a piece of garbage, a piece of dirt. You're, he took that all away. I am his son. I am forgiven. As far as the east is from the west. So there's my life. All the dirty, dark secrets I'm out for you to see and, and know. If you have any questions, come ask. If you are, if I've described you in some way, shape, or form as not my doing, I, I told you it was my life, it was, but it's God's story. God has a story for you. There's a way out. If you need to talk, there's a prayer room back there. Dan and the elders can pray with you, talk to you. I could be there too if you have any questions. My wife and I are a team. We believe that this may be where he wants us. Talk about our uh, struggles, but also talk about this side of it. We've been redeemed. We've been reconciled. So let's pray. Father God, thank you so much.